rediscovering their friendship or a diplomatic situationship. Former enemies Saudi Arabia and Iran have agreed to resume bilateral relations following Chinese-led mediation, restoring ties between the two nations for the first time since 2016. Tensions were strained further when both sides fought for opposing sides in the Yemeni civil war, one of the many proxy wars fought between the two. But now, with ties strengthening, a huge domino effect could happen in the Middle East and across the globe. For Israel, Saudi Arabia is the jewel in the normalization crown, and with its alignment with Israel's foe Iran, could Saudi Arabia become a very powerful new enemy? And on the global stage, a Saudi Iranian deal spearheaded by China sends a clear message to the US. Is an anti-Western coalition gaining steam? And what could it mean for the US? What does Saudi Arabia, a country that has shifted its focus in recent years from confrontation to diplomacy, gain from jumping into bed with an international pariah like Iran, especially whilst there is so much instability on the Iranian front? Who are the winners and losers of this deal? What will be the consequences of the Saudi Iranian deal? So let's get to it, uh, gentlemen. What will be the consequences of the Iran-Saudi deal? As always, we begin with a quick fire round, 30 seconds each to lay out your initial stance on the matter, and we'll pick it up from there. So Ben, ben Talabalu, please take the lead. Your 30 seconds are on. Thank you. A pleasure to be with you all. Uh, listen, I think even if substantively nothing comes of the deal and the deal is actually not even implemented, let alone the diplomatic exchange happens between Tehran and Riyadh, stylistically, the deal is a win for China and it's a win for the Islamic Republic. Uh, it's a potential negative in the category of Israel and it's a loss for Saudi Arabia and it's a loss for the United States of America. But most importantly, these are signs of the trend lines of things to come. Iran trying to use diplomacy to break out of isolation and increase Chinese interest in the Persian Gulf. Okay, Luayl Sharif, your thoughts? I don't believe it's a loss for Saudi Arabia. I believe Saudi Arabia's uh, policy is very clear to lower tensions in the region. Now, this will not hinder anything that is happening on the other front with Israel. I believe it, yeah, I agree with your guess that it was a, it was a win for China and it proved that China is a trusted mediator um, in the region. But by the way, Iran has good relations with, or has relations with the UAE and with other countries as well. So the new diplomacy in the Middle East, lowering tensions and making more peace. Last but not least, Nadav Tamir, your thoughts? I agree that uh, the consequences will be lower tensions, uh, also uh, bilaterally between the two countries and in, in the Yemen a civil war, which I think more chances that it will be resolved. I actually believe that diplomacy is better for everybody, including Israel. Uh, I would have wanted the Americans to be the uh, broker and not the Chinese. I prefer American domination in this region. Uh, but I do believe that diplomacy is better for uh, for Israel as well. Yes, and on that note, uh, gentlemen, let's uh, please feel free uh, to uh, interact from this point uh, onwards. We will dive in further into the American-Chinese uh, uh, bottom line here in the second part of our debate. But let's let's begin uh, with uh, focusing on, on the Middle East uh, and borrowing uh, perhaps the terminology from other Iranian-related uh, debates. Is any reconciliation better than? No reconciliation, Luai? Well, yes, it's, it's, it's um, you see, uh, reconciliation is better than no, no conciliation at all because, you know, Saudi Arabia and Iran, they are neighboring rivals. Uh, for, uh, for seven years, there were no relations and actually there were lots of attacks by Iranian-backed militias. So when Saudi Arabia, use this way to, um, uh, rather than confrontation, but, but use diplomacy, I believe it brings um, the future, uh, the, the, the best for everyone, for, uh, for the future of the region. Saudi Arabia, by the way, is so busy with building itself, is so busy with empowering its people, is so busy with thriving its people and thriving the region. Saudi Arabia doesn't want anything for the Middle East, but to be a stable Middle East. And to be very honest, what happened proves to me that the American administration, the current American administration role was so weakened. So this is why someone else had to 
um, intervene and step up at the stage. So China did that and filled the gap and and, and reached something. But it's too soon to judge. We have two more months to see how things will go. Uh, well, this is why we Please. have to. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. This is why we have to clarify the timeline here. Mm -hmm. I agree that Saudi Arabia's increased hedging towards Iran politically and the desire, as both guests said, to use diplomacy to try to adjudicate the whole range of conflicts it has with the Islamic Republic. I believe that desire and that imperative was not born of a political vacuum. The Chinese actually did not midwife this deal. Let's not forget, from 2021, once the Biden administration came into office, the Saudis began a series of bilateral negotiations with the Iranians, mostly through the help of former Prime Minister Khadami in Iraq, in an effort to reduce tensions, but also to signal the importance of Riyadh's interest in being a partner for stability to the American order and to President Biden in particular, who, I, in my view, mistakenly singled out Saudi Arabia uh, due to the politics of the Khashoggi affair and everything else. But so this was used as a political signal by Riyadh. But the Chinese took this to this conclusion, which is to say that they could use the desire for Saudi Arabia to want to be a status quo player to kind of drive a, a wedge politically, if not substantively, between Israel and Saudi. And then, of course, strategically to make some Americans who already want to divorce Saudi Arabia to have a bitter taste in their mouth. That's why I think it's a loss for Saudi Arabia. Iran has never been constrained by any of the agreements, nuclear, missile, military, political. Uh, it has signed under the 44-year auspices of the Islamic Republic. So to think that all of a sudden by reopening an embassy in Tehran, which again, the Iranians could overtake again that peace will come to the region is i think unfounded empirically you know the iraqis in between these two mm -hmm. giants tried to moderate some kind of a peace accord to think that the iranians have now found more creative ways to arm the houthis even when there was a ceasefire or to support local production as they perfected in places like uh, in places like gaza with hamas and palestinian islamic jihad is to not understand the nature of the iranian threat and that's why we have to zoom out to understand why did the Chinese really want this to happen? It's to help wrap up or begin to show the crumbling of the American order in the region and to present a potentially alternate model, but one that will mean a fundamentally different kind of Saudi role and a fundamentally different kind of Iranian role as well. So, Nadav Tamir, you're, you're listening to Mr. Ben Tolbulu here uh, uh, suggesting it is not a deviation uh, from Iran's uh, uh, strategic goal of regional dominance, but quite the opposite, very much part of the plan. Bottom line, uh, will it restrain or embolden the Islamic Republic in the short term? I think it's simplistic to look at Iran as one monolithic thing. I think that since the withdrawal of Trump from the JCPOA, um, the Revolutionary Guards became much stronger, the extremists became much stronger. I think that any diplomacy makes Iran less, uh, less extreme, and that means that uh, the power, the more moderate powers within the regime uh, will get the upper hand. And I think that's good news for Israel. Uh, and it could be good news for the U.S., except for the 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 part that the Chinese are getting deeper into the region. And I would of uh, uh, you know, hope that it would be the Americans. But I think um, we, we see that the Saudis stopped uh, uh, counting on the Americans when Trump did not respond when the Iranians hit the Aramco site. And the Iranians understood that they could not do deals with the Americans when Trump withdrew from the JCPOA. And that's how the Chinese came in. But, but, but staying Iran-centric here, is the Saudi kosher stamp, so to speak, uh, uh, giving Iran uh, an oxygen line, Luayal Sharif? No, I don't, I, I, I don't think it um, can be simply narrated mm -hmm. as this. Now, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia would never approve such a deal without having its conditions. And Saudi conditions are very harsh. So one of them was not intervening in sovereign decisions made by each party. And one of them also not supporting uh, uh, terrorism or, uh, or, uh, or militias. I, I think this deal, if it goes like it's, it's, uh, it's stated by MOFA, I believe it will bring lower tensions to the region. This is why I stated last night in your channel that I don't believe, or I believe that the best or the first um, positive impression of this deal that there will be no escalation in Ramadan. You might yeah. say, how is this related? Yeah. Gaza, Gaza is, is governed by Hamas, which is backed by Iran. And I believe it's not in Iran's interest to 
to uh, to show some to show good intention to fire up an escalation in the holy month of Ramadan. So I believe this is one thing that was that will happen. Second of all, the Houthis in Yemen as well and the war in Yemen, which which Saudi Arabia wants to end and Saudi Arabia wants to bring prosperity to the Yemeni people, it will also have a, a positive effect. Saudi would never sign such a deal without having their harsh conditions on it, conditions that would bring more stability to the region. It's not an oxygen line. It's something that would put some limits mm -hmm. and would tell the Iranians that diplomacy works. And the Iranians, by the way, I believe that the Iranians, they want to have some sort of hope in order to feel because they are so isolated. So they want to have some sort of hope that they can merge in the region. And Prince Mohammed said that on the national TV a year ago, that he wants to see Iran as a neighboring country, as, as, a, as a neighboring um, uh, ally, and as someone yeah. or, or a, as a country that wants to prosper within their neighbors. Yeah, uh, so we're nearing the uh, end of the first part of our, our debate. So Mr. Bentel Balu, uh, briefly, if you can, is it raising or lowering the prospects of, of a renewed nuclear deal? Uh, it, in fact, may be irrelevant to the prospect mm -hmm. of a renewed nuclear deal. What it may actually do is it may hinder the very positive momentum we've seen, not on the nuclear side, but on the human rights side. Mm. Many human rights activists in Canada, America, Australia, New Zealand, uh, EU, UK, uh, for the past six months uh, have been calling for a downgrading of countries that have diplomatic ties with the Islamic Republic given the six months of anti-regime protests. Yeah. Now people who want to keep those embassies open of Iran on their own territory are pointing to the fact that countries on the front line of the Iranian threat who strategically and ideationally have suffered for four decades like Saudi Arabia given the export of the Islamic Republic's revolution mm -hmm. abroad are now actually tightening ties. So I think Again, this deal is not only a strategic mistake, it's not only a political mistake, it may end up underwriting a future moral mistake on a fundamentally different domain. Not yeah. nuclear, but human rights issues as well. This is a bad deal any way you slice it, in my view. Okay, Nadav Tamir, very, very quickly before we take a short break, uh, is it the time for the U.S. and Israel to up the pressure on the Saudis uh, to reach normalization as a balancing act, so to speak? In order for that to happen, the Palestinian issue has to be part of the of the equation. Uh, the Saudis will not go for anything that uh, does not recognize the Arab initiative, which started as a Saudi initiative. Uh, the Israeli government is not prepared for anything like that, but I think the Americans could still lead something international that will uh, okay. give the Saudis uh, what they want, oh, okay. which I think is also good for Israel. Nadav Tamil Al Sharif Benamental Bull, you're staying with us a quick break. And when we get back, is it all at the end about China and the U.S.? Short break and we're back. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us. Still uh, uh, with us on this uh, summit, our panelists, Luai Al-Sharif, Nadav Tamir, and Ben Bentel Balu. Thank you, gentlemen, uh, for sticking with us. We're also staying on topic, of course. But before we get back, uh, you know, it's not their party, so they can't really cry if they want to. Washington, someone... Uh, left uh, behind here, uh, compelled to congratulate the deal, but is it really happy about it? Let's take a quick listen and pick it up from there. We welcome any efforts to help end the war in Yemen and de-escalate tensions in the Middle East region. That is one of the reasons why the president, you saw him travel uh, in over the summer uh, to, to have those conversations. De-escalation and diplomacy together with deterrence are key pillars of the policy that the president, uh, that President Biden uh, uh, put out, uh, outlined during his, uh, his visit in July in the region. So again, de-escalation, uh, tensions in the Middle East clearly is a priority and he welcomes that. So let's get to it. Is it a red flag? Should the U.S. be worried about the Iranian-Saudi deal? Another quick fire round, and we uh, continue from there. Luayl Sharif, please take the lead. I don't think the U.S. should be worried about that because, as the spokesman said, any efforts to de-escalate is something would benefit the countries of the region. And I just want to say one thing, Eli, when you, when you talked about uh, a, a, a pressure or should be a pressure by mm -hmm. the U.S. to push for a peace with Israel. I believe that Saudi Arabia cannot be pressured. It's not I believe, it's a fact. Saudi Arabia cannot be pressured and the UAE cannot be pressured to have peace with uh, a country or another state. Uh, they are sovereign nations. They would make 
the best for their people. And if Saudi feels that it's the right decision to make peace with Israel, it would do it with its conditions. But not because uh, of pressure. Yeah, peace uh, perhaps is uh, the only thing that cannot be actually uh, forced. And Adav Tamir, uh, your take. Should the U.S. be worried? I think that uh, lowering the tensions in the Middle East is also an American interest. Uh, the Chinese involvement less. I think uh, the timing of the announcement of the U uh, Australia, UK, um, uh, US uh, submarine uh, and, and the regional uh, cooperation might yeah. be kind of the answer that they're not uh, giving up on domination uh, in the world. Last but not least, Ben and Ben Tolbalu, your thoughts? Uh, yes, well, best probably not to use, to use the word domination, but nonetheless, uh, the U.S. is, of course, going to be the, the net major loser of this, given the order uh, it helped to create uh, in that region, uh, really with the establishment of CENTCOM, but really starting with the post-Cold War order taking over uh, what the British had uh, in the Persian Gulf, in the Strait of Hormuz, and in the Middle East. But as I said earlier, these are signs of trend lines of things to come. China and, uh, and uh, China is the largest trade partner of Iran and Saudi, so expect more Chinese involvement, not less. Yeah, one road, one belt. Uh, you should just uh, read what it says, and it's all uh, there. So let me ask you, gentlemen, bluntly, and once again, uh, we encourage your interaction, of course. Where was the U.S.? What was more important um, uh, than keeping tabs on that, Benham? This is a great question, and that's why conditions matter more for the two comments made by the distinguished colleagues on this panel. The conditions that would put Saudi Arabia, which was such a critical pillar of that U.S. order for so many decades in the region, to want to seek peace, not with Iran's adversary and Saudi's partner, America, but with Iran's partner, the People's Republic of China. The conditions were not the May 8, 2018 withdrawal that some continue to mistakenly see the entire U.S.-Iran conflict through. The U.S. and Iran have basically been at war since the Islamic Republic was founded in 1979. So the U.S. dropped the ball on this, and for sustained missteps in the region under Democratic and Republican presidents, lost the trust of some of the key pillars of the order it helped establish there. And due to this, you had increased not just Saudi hedging, but UAE hedging as well. Some have even said Israel has hedged uh, not just on Iran issues, but on larger great power competition mm. issues as it relates to states like Russia and China. So it is imperative for the U.S. if it wants to retain the order it helped establish there to work with and through its partners and to make sure it has their back and sees the region the same way. When you have things like the JCPOA, which is behind the back of the Saudis yeah. or when, and, the, and the Emiratis and the Israelis and everyone else in the region, and when you have things like not responding to the downing of your own drones by the Iranians, many states in the region are going to have to hedge because if they cannot balance against Iran, they're going to have to find a way to bandwagon because they live on the front lines of this threat. And the Chinese way was the easiest, fastest way. But the question is, will it be durable? So to that point exactly, Alwal Sharif, uh, uh, can, should the U.S. really, you know, get out of the Middle Eastern quagmire? Well, when you first asked where is the U.S., that one, what one of the questions that was asked when the U.S. withdrew when the uh, when 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 Afghanistan uh, last August fell um, by, um, and, and overtook, overtaken by the Taliban, so that was really sent, that sent a very bad mm -hmm. message to America's allies. So you see, America can make absence that would maybe damage um, their allies, and I believe that. Um, to be very honest, this region, the Middle East, has to take care of itself, by itself. We don't need an American police officer, but the Americans are great allies of the, the, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and everyone. So if we have this region under our control, if, if Israel is, uh, uh, if Israel makes, or if Arab neighbors, there are uh, Israel's neighbors from the Arab countries make yeah. peace with Israel and uh, and lower te lowering more tensions in the region and the region would take care of itself. We wouldn't need an American presence in this way, in in in, a, in the police officer way. Um, I think it's it's the best for the region to reconciliate. And this is why I was I was saying that the Iran Saudi deal will never damage the uh, the future. Um, uh, peace deal with Israel. The future peace deal with Israel. On that uh, note, and it's inevitable. It's just a matter of time. It's a matter of time.
Nadav Tamir, what do you think? I think that I can completely understand why America doesn't want boots on the ground. All their uh, military interventions were a failure, but we definitely need a proactive American diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I would expect more uh, from the Biden administration to be more more uh, involved in the region. Uh, I think the, the original scene was the withdrawal from the JCPOA with the Trump administration, which uh, caused, uh, uh, you know, the Iranians to feel that they can't really go back to any kind of agreement with an American administration that could do such thing. And JCPOA is not a stab in the back of Israel. I believe that this is, it is the interest of Israel. And since the withdrawal from the JCPOA, we see how Iran is getting closer and closer to military nuclear capabilities. Okay, gentlemen, we're really nearing the end of our discussion here. Uh, so let's uh, zoom out. In retrospect, we will, will we be pointing out at uh, this point in time as the beginning of the Beijing-centric world order, if you will, because from Iran and Saudi, Xi Jinping is now aiming at Zelensky and putting Russia and Ukraine on his agenda. No, I, I think to not to go first, but it's too early to tell. The green shoots of this deal, whether you're a proponent or opponent of it, still are yet to be seen. And again, this is not an opposition to diplomacy. It's a cautionary note. Diplomacy, like every other thing in this world, is never born out of a political or a social vacuum. It is a response to a certain context. So it is not about Iran-Saudi peace, and it is not about growing Chinese interest in the Persian Gulf. It's the conditions that mm -hmm. bring those things about. And that will tell you if the Chinese fear more emboldened to try to press their model in a place like Ukraine or elsewhere. So paying attention to those conditions rather than the tools is going to give us the answer in the in the future. Well, Sharif. I don't say I don't say it. Uh, I don't I don't say it in the way that it's just the, whether it's the Chinese uh, or the American presence, w which will be more than the other. I believe it's it's the new era of of, of a stable Middle East. You know this this. Uh, Middle East suffered a lot of, of uh, yeah. instabilities, and now it's the t it's time for its people to uh, prosper. I believe the tensions that were made in the Arab Gulf now need to settle down, and diplomacy is the way. China intervened, yeah. which is a good thing, and we will see the fruits of it. I see it's too soon to talk about the results, and there are yeah. no yet ambassadors there, so we need yeah. to wait for two yeah. more months at least. Yeah, and Adav Tamir, 10 seconds left. The, the biggest priority in my eyes is the Palestinian issue. It's the interest of Israel, it's the interest of all the region, and the, we need the Americans' involvement well, to get there. The Chinese, I don't think, care yeah. too much about this issue.